This is the second and final part of a conversation with Andy Rausch, a.k.a. Andrew J. Rausch, writer of fiction and nonfiction. First of all, I love the title, Crazy Ass Stories for Crazy Ass People, which right. is short stories that you wrote, correct? Right. That was my second short story collection. That came out uh, about six weeks ago, I think. So it's been a prolific. T- lately, things are just rolling out. Um, but most of these are things I've been working on for years. Like, that was a collection of stories I'd done mostly in the last five years since my last anthology came out. That was called Death Rattles. I think that was in 2014, um, 13, 14, something like that. I just, I stay really busy. The crazy-ass people thing, it was funny because whenever anybody does a story on it, I always tell them, please put the hyphens in the title. Because if you don't put crazy hyphen-ass people then people, you know, are crazy ass stories. People think it's just crazy stories that are about asses. <laughs> that's not what it is. It's, I, I'm not, uh, this isn't uh, Cardi B. Like I heard, I can't remember who it was. I, I think it was somebody, you know, that just, uh, it was Nicki Minaj that makes a lot of songs about her ass. I, even, I don't want to have a whole book about asses. So. <laughs> so I'm definitely looking forward to reading that as well. I did read part of one of the stories, which I was hooked right from that moment. So, um, I, oh gosh, Elvis Presley, CIA assassin. Right, that was a novel I did. Um, I don't know, probably five or six years ago. It was uh, it was my one comedic novel. I had fun with it. I don't think it's my best novel. I don't think it's bad, but I think straight comedy is not really my forte. I think. I write comedy in some of my books, but it's usually to sort of give us a breather from the violence or from the, the intense situations. Um, and people will, will write in the reviews, you know, I laughed out loud multiple times. And, that, and that's great, but I think I learned from that one that a whole book of just humor isn't really my forte. I think there are a lot of uh, jokes in it that are funny, but I think there are a lot of jokes in it that fall kind of flat. And So you live and you learn. Uh, that was an idea that I had actually kind of gotten from Quentin Tarantino. At one time, he was going to do a book or a, do a movie about um, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley had wanted to join the FBI. That was a real thing, and and it had never happened. It was before, it was just an idea he had. And, and then uh, you know, I found out about uh, Elvis actually meeting with President Nixon, and I got this idea: what if what if Elvis, you know, convinced. Uh, Nixon or Nixon convince him one way or the other he becomes a CIA agent and not just a CIA agent but even more so a CIA assassin right. which is just ridiculous <laughs> um, I'm frankly surprised that book has stayed on the market I thought that uh, the Elvis people might be annoyed but you know it's so ridiculous you can't really be too mad at it nobody thinks although I, I was going to say nobody thinks it's real but I did have someone one time in an Elvis uh chat room or an Elvis Facebook page, uh, somebody in there was saying, I don't even believe this is true. I think this, I think these are lies. Like, oh. I don't believe any of this is true. And I thought, oh. who in the hell could possibly think this is a real story? And, but you know, that was great. That was one of my favorite reviews ever. Another great review I got one time um, for one of my books was, it was for my first novel, which was originally called uh, The Suicide Game. And then was later reprinted by a different publisher under the title Mad World. But uh, someone wrote on there, this guy is obviously on drugs. I will never read another one of his books. And I just thought, that's hilarious. That, that's one. Of, and then I got a review one time. Most of my reviews are good, honestly. Mad World had, I think, 46, 47 reviews on Amazon. A bunch on Goodreads. And on Amazon, I think it was at four stars. So that's pretty good for almost 50 reviews. Yeah. But... But there are a couple of shitty ones in there, and one of them, somebody just said, this book was stupid. <laughs> oh. the, the whole review, and I thought, wow, that was really helpful for other readers. I'm glad that you enlightened us, yep. you know, and I'm glad as a writer I can take that critique and move forward and know exactly what not to do. Don't what? make it stupid. So. Yeah, well, yeah, sure, absolutely. Right, you know, these are good things. I'm That's... glad that people with such insight are allowed to voice their opinions everywhere. I know. That's you, what, I was going to say that's what makes America America, but sadly, that it's kind of what is making America America. 
Exactly. Exactly. And and what I, I actually, I hate seeing those kinds of reviews, of course, because not only do I feel bad for the person that they're talking about, but, you know, it, it, it could potentially stifle someone's creativity. Right, right. And if that person stopped another person from creating something else that could have been amazing, that's so sad. Right. You know, it is. It was funny. I had a review one time for a book I did on war films, and the, and they were they gave it a horrible review simply because there were no photographs in the book. And I thought, who promised you photographs? Like oh. my book that I wrote, my work that I spent eight months or a year on, is being criticized because the publisher decided not to put photographs in it. You know, and. Because a lot of people just glance at the, the the amount of stars and just if it's shitty they just move on. And I so I was a little irritated by that. But sometimes the reviews are funny, you know. And it's funny I can get ninety nine good reviews, but that hundredth review will make me depressed for weeks. I can find every excuse not to believe the good reviews because that's sort of how I am. But you know, because um, I am overcritical of myself, overly critical. I think that's but, true um, of of most creatives, actually. But boy, that one shitty review, I'll believe it. Even if I know it's the thing they're saying might not even be true, but I'll I'll beat myself up about it for days. Now, how many books again? <laughs> uh, this year, it'll be 37. That's amazing. I, I have uh, I... a novel coming out after... I have a novel called Layla's Score that's supposed to come out uh, after the Tarantino book, I think in August or September. I don't know. I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to feel like maybe it's okay to smile when I tell people that. Maybe, you know, I mean, I, 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 I never bragged. I always was, you know, very, because I would talk about it, but it was because I was shocked that these things were happening. But now that I'm getting close to 40 of them, I feel like maybe it's okay to take a little credit, you know, because um, it, it didn't happen on its own. Whether I think it's deserved or not doesn't matter, because apparently those 18 or 19 publishers I published with, they thought it did. Good for them. Good for me. Good. That's it. Good for me, not them. Good for me. Good for you is right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, oh gosh, let's see. I'm going to pick another one here. Uh, Wyatt Earp meets Dr. Death. All right. Well, that was a book. It was originally called Wyatt Earp and the Devil Incarnate. And that oh. was, but you know what? I, I like Westerns okay. I think they're interesting. Basically, I just like stories with tension and gunplay and stuff like that. Um, as I also like samurai movies, and they're sort of a take on the, the, the Western story. But, um, you know, I'd never really thought I would write one. But then uh, I met a guy, um, what is his name, Troy, I can't think of his last name, Troy Davis, I think. But he was he had a publishing company at the time called um, Western Trailblazers. And it was a small uh, little Western publisher. And I thought... Well, I wonder if I could do this. So I just did it as an experiment, and they published it. And uh, it was a story about Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday meeting a serial killer in the streets of Tombstone. It was really different. Uh, but the, the, the company went out of business almost as soon as the book came out, like literally within two or three months. And, and then it just sat for a long time. And then... This last year, I did something I never do. I tried. I was going to self-publish it. I stuck it out there. There's an a Kindle version out there that's my self-published version, but I, it didn't really have a proper release. So it, I ended up tacking it on. Uh, it's a novella. I stuck it in the back of the Crazy Ass Stories book. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's a bonus. That would be a good one for you know, that's an interesting one for a movie or a. You know, I'm writing comic books now. I'm. I'm actually um, scheduled to, to do like four different comics and working on uh, one now. And I thought, you know, that'd be an interesting idea for a comic. I've never pitched it, but that'd be cool. That Actually, that I, I can sort of picture it here. <laughs> right, that right. That would be interesting. Wow. Quick, write it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I have to write that down. I'll have to pitch that later on. That's right. A comic book. So now we're in comic books, which I know we had talked about before, too, which I just, I find it amazing. Well, I mean, you just... know, I've always loved comic books, but that never seemed attainable. Like, it didn't seem like a thing that, 
it wasn't my primary interest, but mainly because I didn't, I don't know, I, it just didn't seem like, for whatever reason, it didn't seem like a thing I could do. And then a friend of mine, David Hayes, uh, like I said, whom I'd written some things with, including the Bloody Sheet screenplay, uh, he had, had written a graphic novel in the early 2000s called Rotten Tail, which was a crazy horror uh, mutant bunny story. And anyway, it got picked up. It was independently, and it didn't do much. It was just out there. And it got picked up in 2015 by a new um, a new comic book company that was just starting and is really kind of taking off now and, uh, called Source Point Press. And they, they put Rotten Tail everywhere. And so now there's a movie of Rotten Tail. Um, so anyway, he, he said, right. hey, do you want to work on a comic? Because I really wanted to work on a comic. I might have mentioned that I was jealous. And so he hooked me up to work on a comic book called Union Corpse, which is a play on, you know, Union Corps. Mm-hmm. Uh, an E at the end, and it's about Civil War zombies. And then we're doing one about serial killers in hell and uh, trying to get out of hell, famous serial killers. And we're doing one about uh, a, a sort of new take on vampires, which uh, is going to be kind of crazy. And the other one is going to be based on a novel we wrote together called M Company. Um, M Company in the Axis of Evil. And the idea was M Company actually is short for Monster Company. Yeah. It was an idea that we would have uh, sort of classic monsters like, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and a wolf man. And I have to say a wolf man because I can't say the wolf man. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, Universal owns that. Yes. But, you know, just these, these classic types of uh, monsters battling Nazis in World War II. And so that's a thing that we're going to make a comic of now. Okay. It's crazy. So, I mean, some of the things that you've already written is actually fuel for the future things. It seems that way. Like, that's becoming a reality. Yeah. And, you know, I've got a character uh, that I've written in a couple of books now um, and a short story uh who is, it's funny, it's another black character written by a white guy, and again, you know, but I just thought it was fascinating, this idea, he is a serial killer, or not a serial killer, he was a, a hitman. He was a black hitman, his name is Orlando Williams, and he works in this all-Italian mafioso world. He's kind of a crazy character, but he was really unique, and I, thought, I think that's what stood out, was that he, by day, he was a professor of Russian literature at UCLA, and sort of his night job, his real job, is to murder people for money. And mm-hmm. and he doesn't do it for, he doesn't buy flashy things, he doesn't do it. It's just sort of what he does. And, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, and, and he's written these books on Dostoyevsky, and, and also he's he's a hitman, and I just thought that was a crazy character, and it, and other, and it he was one character in a book, of, in my book, Mad World, of like five or six characters whose paths intersect. People like that character so much that um, yeah, that I revived him. So it's funny, I have to say, I never set out to write a lot of black characters, because, I mean, again, that's kind of unusual for a white writer. But, you know, when the, the Klansman story, Bloody Sheets, came to me, there's really no other way to do that. I mean... You know, and, and that, that story is important, and again, I don't care, because I love these characters, you know, the, the protagonists in all these stories, whether they're men or women, black, white, it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah. Um, again, gay, you know, there's, these are the things, how can you write that if you're not gay? Well, hey, guess what, I'm still a human being. Right. I, I still love people, you know. They're not maybe the same people, does it matter? Right. And again, those are people, so... I don't know. Uh, that's that's always my take on these things. Bloodletting, a tale of revenge. Well, bloodletting is actually, um, oh, there's a long story there, kind of. Um, okay, so bloodletting started out as, it was first published in 2012, 2011 maybe, as uh, writing Shotgun by a publishing company called Taylor Street. I think. And they didn't last very long. They went out of business. Then it was reprinted under the title Bloodletting by 
another publishing company, Burning Bull, Public, Burning Bull Press, and then a couple years ago it was reprinted in a collection, in an anthology of, uh, or a collection of uh, novellas by me, and that was called Riding Shotgun and Other American Cruelties. Okay. And it's been very popular. It's been published by three different companies and lived three different lives, and it remains... And honestly, it's sort of the precursor to Bloody Sheets. It really is. It's it's not a race story or anything, but it's the first. It's very similar in that it deals with revenge issues and it deals with a parent and a child, you know. Um, and for whatever reason, this seems to be a key that keeps, that shows up again and again in my work is characters having to sort of fight for their children, either fighting for them or then avenging them or, you know, um, I wrote a book about a character uh, who was a hitman and he sort of has his daughter in tow, which is a little like, it's a lot different, honestly, but it's a, it, on its surface, it's a lot like Road to Perdition, which was written mm-hmm. by Max Allen Collins, right. and which was originally inspired by the Lone Wolf and Cub movies and manga books uh, from Japan. So, you know, um, I don't know why it is. Uh, again, uh, you're a therapist, so you, you would probably know more than I do, but but it is a theme that keeps coming up. And, and I have five children, and I'm very passionate about my five children. I haven't always been the best parent, but I've tried. Um, and the mistakes that I've made, particularly with one of them, I've tried my damnedest to, to make up for it, and I hope I, hope I do. Um, okay. So maybe some of those guilt feelings come up in this, or maybe my characters are trying to be the parent that I don't think I am. Because hmm. again, as we talked about, I never feel like I'm good enough at anything I do. But that also fuels me to keep writing, and and it also fuels those stories in that way. So a little tidbit about me, I guess. Um, let's see. Now, I have a, a snowy night in Brooklyn. Right. What, what is that? I had written that uh, for a submissions call. For a book, uh, Gavino Iglesias is doing uh, about Notorious B.I.G. And uh, Notorious B.I.G., Biggie Small, was one of my very favorite uh, rappers of all time and MCs. So uh, anyway, I had written this crazy story about Biggie. Uh, see, before this, I'd written a story for an anthology the same publisher, Clash Books, had done uh, on stories about were inspired by Wu-Tang Clan, which is my favorite hip-hop group. It's my favorite any group, honestly. Okay. And and I get to see them twice this summer, so I'm very excited about that. So anyway, I, I'd written this story about where uh, Biggie goes to this medium, uh, and it's not long before he dies, and he goes to this medium to speak with Tupac, who was Tupac Shakur, who they were uh, rivals before Tupac died. It's a silly story, but, it, it, but it's actually, I think, got a lot of heart to it. Uh, it didn't get accepted for the anthology. That makes me really sad. But I really wanted to work with Gabino because I think he's a fantastic writer, um, a really neat up and coming writer um, who just did a book called uh, Coyote Songs. He is a great writer. So anyway, uh, it made me really sad, but that one didn't make the cut. So I ended up there was nothing else I could do with it because it was written so specifically for an audience that would be familiar with those people and their scenario, mm-hmm. the situations that surround them. So I ended up just sticking it on my little, uh, I have a little, like a blog page. I hardly ever post anything. I hadn't posted a story since January 1st, but I posted that on there. I don't know how many people are going to understand it because again, without context, it's, you're sort of just starting out in the middle of a story, but, um, you know, so that's always the risk you run when you write things specifically tailored to a certain anthology call. But you know, that ended my streak. I had written successfully for nine consecutive anthologies and magazines. Nine, which is great, because it was a period in my life early on where I probably submitted a hundred stories in a year and they didn't get published. This was when I was in my early 20s. and So to get nine in a row was pretty fantastic. So I can't be too sad about that 10th one. And either way, I'm going to go buy that book. I'm very excited about the book and I'm happy for Gabino and the rest of them. You know, I... That's, that's, there's a writer named Michael Gonzalez I know, a great writer that uh, used to write for The Source, which was the big hip-hop magazine. They called it the, the Bible of Hip-Hop. And anyway, he wrote a story for it. I'm very excited to see what that looks like. So. 
Excellent. So yeah. what what now is is your blog page something that you would uh, be okay with pointing people to? They want to check it out. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's just uh, I think if you just look up all is one word author Andy Roush, just author Andy Roush, no spaces in between. Okay, it'll come up. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's just a really basic blog page. There's a couple stories on there. Um, a couple of them that are in my anthologies, but or in my collections. But um, yeah, so to give people a taste of my writing. Okay. Um, wow, we, we've covered a ton, we, we've covered a ton, and yet we probably haven't gone through half of the books that you've written, <laughs> I, which is I, crazy. <laughs> I stay busy, I stay busy. Yes, you do. Yes, you absolutely do. Um, and before I forget, I, I, I know I mentioned this last time we spoke, but I, congratulations, one year, yay, right. your heart also, transplant, that's awesome. Did I, I don't know if I mentioned that when we spoke. But, no. Um, about a month ago, I think I was beating myself up because when you and I had talked previously, I didn't mention it, but about a month ago, um, my daughter, Jalen, and her boyfriend, Brian, had a beautiful baby, my first grandchild. I can't believe I'm old enough to be a grandfather. <laughs> Emma. Emma. And, okay. Emma. Yeah, and I'm sort of writing a story about Emma now. So okay. we'll see. It's sort of a new take on the... The uh, old themes, I guess. It's not really about Emma, but it's about uh, it's about a grandchild. It's a different take on the same old thing, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Well, Trying to take it in a slightly different direction. Congratulations again to you because you're with us. Yay. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. Good. Yeah, everything is every one of these things just I think is it is just a, it's just a blessing. I'm so happy to be here. Every day I wake up, I open my eyes, and I think. Wow, I made it another day. Because the reality is I was not going to make it. Uh, I would like to say, all you have to do is check a box. You know, tell them when you get a driver's license that you want to be an organ donor. Make sure your family knows, because they can override your wishes. So make sure they absolutely know that's what you want. Because one person's body can help something like 75 people. You know, different things like skin, and different parts of the eye. and You know, you're not going to use them. So why let other people suffer and die? Just because you're selfish, because you're, no one's going to use them. They're going in the earth. Yes. And, you know, so that's, I think that's the last thing you can ever do for anyone, and it's probably the best thing you can ever do for anyone. Absolutely. I've actually been an organ donor since I got my license, so for, oh, many, 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 many years. That's great. No, it's <laughs> great. And it's, it's a thing that a lot of people don't think about, and I don't know why there's not more... Uh, more awareness, like uh, things pushing awareness out there. Because you see ads for everything else, but I hardly, I rarely ever, even now as I'm more aware of them, ever see advertising encouraging people to become organ donors. And so many people die waiting for a heart, a lung, a kidney. You know, um, I've known people that have died in that wait, and and it's horrible. You know, those, and when you think about it, you don't just help 75 people. You help all of the people that know them, too. You help their children, their spouses, their families. So, in essence, you end up helping a thousand people just by checking a box. It's not that hard, you know. Um, be selfless. I agree. I, you know what? We should do that. We should do something about that. Right. Even if it's just, you know, social media posts and all that good stuff reminding people because you're right. I mean, I'm an organ donor, but I don't ever talk about it, <laughs> you know. I um, so, all right. I think that's a fabulous plan. So, I, well, I know that you are running short of time. I can talk a few more minutes if you okay. want. I don't okay. really have to leave for another ten minutes, so. Okay. I do have to go get my little girl. Absolutely. My, my littlest one, uh, oh. Jocelyn, who uh, is sort of the, the, the basis of the character Layla in my novel Layla's score. Oh. It's not her, but it's... In a lot of ways, it is her. I took the cue from Stephen King, who wrote uh, Charlie McGee, The Little Girl in Firestarter, mm. based on his daughter. And, you know, uh, but yeah, that's that's my little girl, and that's what I'm going to do in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, nice. Well, hello to Miss Jocelyn when you see her. Hey, I will. 
Yes, and if, you know, I know we we did touch on the project you were doing, um, or did perspectives on Stephen King, which um, I, I mentioned last time. He's like my all time. I have a lot of favorite writers, but like you know, he's the too. one that started it all for me when I was just a twelve year old and should not have been reading his books, but did and fell in love with Same. reading as a result. So thank you, Stephen. I, I discovered him in the middle school library, which is hilarious that he was in the... Right. He had Carrie in the middle school library. <laughs> and as kind of, I'm going to be honest, as kind of an outsider, the idea of her just destroying everything at the end I really resonated with me. And, you know, I probably shouldn't say that now that we're in an era of school shootings and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, but the idea of her just wreaking havoc and getting her revenge just sounded amazing to me as, as a 13-year-old outcast kid. And, yep. <laughs> So, but he, but he writes characters like no one else. Like, yes. It, at least that I've read. I I read a lot, but not as much as some people. You know, and, and I can't. And I tend to stick with a lot of the same authors. I try to branch out, but I go back to a lot of the same people. Oh yeah. But King creates characters. He creates. You know, I think I really believe this is an unpopular uh, idea, but I believe that a lot of his books, his bigger books, could be trimmed a little, and they would not lose anything. Yes. But I also don't feel like I'm ever reading fluff, honestly, because that's a man that could write anything, and you'd want to read it. Right. Because he just has a way with words. He, he definitely does. And I know last time we spoke, I was telling you I was in the middle of rereading Salem's Lot. I am still reading it, because <laughs> as you know, that's a big book. <laughs> I love Salem's Lot. And again, that's... Uh, I, see, I love his early work the best. It's not that his new work is bad by any stretch, but... It's more polished, and I kind of, and that, that's a great thing, but I kind of liked him when he was more, it just seemed like he had a gritty edge when, you know, a hunger. I mean, let's be honest. No matter who you are and how hard you try to fight it, once you make a hundred million dollars or whatever mm -hmm. that man has made, and you have had the successes he's had, you're going to lose a little edge. That doesn't mean he's a lesser writer, but it just means that uh, his books are a little more mainstream-ish. You know, and, and yes, he's always become mainstream, but he certainly didn't start out writing mainstream things. He pulled mainstream to him. Right, you know? right, exactly, exactly. Table plot is brilliant. But that's, see, you know, you just said something that made me think, but that is why people like you, you write what you feel, whether or not it's popular at the time, or whether or not it's something you think other people actually want to read, <laughs> I think, right. if I'm getting this correct, um, right. whatever's in your heart and mind is, is what comes out, and, you know, people like it or they don't, you know? Um, but Pretty much, yeah. How, how amazing is that? I mean, I like that? to see there's no consideration whatsoever to whether or not people, you know, whether or not I'll find a publisher, because that's become more of a, as I'm doing so many things, you know, I try not to do anything that's just going to spin my wheels, although the book I just worked on for the last four months and did not complete that's a little bit of that wheel spinning, but, yeah. you know, I try to be careful, but I also, if it makes sense, I try to be careful in a way that still takes chances. Those seem like things that are at odds, but I don't think they really are, you know. Um, I just try to write something that I know that there's an audience for, but write it in a way that's uncompromised. What um, else, because you know, I remember, think you know, I, I, I like to ask one question that, you may not uh, <laughs> you may not be uh, prepared to answer, so I do have that question for you. Um, okay. But anything else before we wrap up? I don't think so. I think that that pretty much covers it. Are you ready for your question? I am ready. All right. Whose life do you envy, and why? Man, I don't know. Look at uh, that! I stumped him. You did. You stumped me. Let's see, whose life do I envy? You know, there's a lot of people whose lives I envy for different reasons, and, and it's changed throughout my life, you know. Um, shit, when I was 18, Hugh Hefner's life might have, uh, I might have been envious of, you know. Yeah. Not now, obviously, now that he's dead. I'm in no hurry to join him. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, your priorities change, and your your thoughts of what... In fact, then I thought, you know, being famous was going to be... I mean, I was talking before about the women in the mansion, but... You know, but also I thought, you know, being famous was this really important thing. And I think 
think that's what a lot of these writers that write to those trends get caught up in, is they want to be famous and they want to make a lot of money. And frankly, I'm to the point where as long as my bills are getting paid and I have food, my kids have food, and I get to write the things that I enjoy, I'm happy. Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like it should be somebody more humanitarian or somebody, but I don't know who it would be. <laughs> Everyone's flawed, so, you know. It's just part of being on. human. And you know, the, my, I'm so writing centric, so writing, uh, my, my mind's always on writing, but I'm sure the person I admire would end up being a writer as opposed to, you know, somebody who should be the, the, that's changed the world or that's, you know, and, and I probably should, should wish to be somebody that's had a more successful track record with relationships. I've been divorced three times. Okay. But, you know, but at the end of and that writing, that love of the writing, that passion for the writing, I think at its core is the reason that I screw up all these relationships because mm. my and probably could have been a better parent. I tried to be a good parent, and I think I was pretty good. But you know, when you work a, a full time job and then you write another five six hours a day, there's not much time for the other people and the other things. You know, and a lot of times, I know it's not like this with every writer, but a lot of times, even when I'm doing the other things, the more important things, well, the things that, you know, are supposed to be more important, my mind is still on the writing. Hmm. I don't know. So I live a life, but it's always, like, when I, I love movies. I write about movies. That's, that was what I started out doing. I love film. But you know what? Every time I go to a film and I sit there, my mind starts thinking, branching off, thinking of places this story could go, and uh. blah, blah, blah. I've come up with several book ideas just sitting in the theater, and some of them haven't been made, but, you know, I, I never ended up writing, but, you know, uh, but that's, for better or worse, that's the way my mind works. Right. So the upside is you end up with 37 plus books. The downside is, is that, you know, you might end up alone <laughs> and hmm. broke, but, hey, that's okay. I well, mean, I don't as long know. as my kids love me and I love them, that's great. And I have a girlfriend now that, she. it seems like she's going to be the next victim. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I mean, I don't plan on ever getting a divorce again, but but she seems like she's uh, going to be the one. Okay. Yeah. So you know what? It sounds to me like you can't really pick someone that you're envious of. It sounds like you're actually, for all its ups and downs, enjoying your life. I really am. I really, and I never thought I would say that. I've, I've been miserable the majority of my life, and that's not a great thing, but... You know, this put it all into perspective. I love it every minute. Andy, this has been absolutely amazing, as usual. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. Um, and like I said, we, we got to make sure that as many people as possible read Bloody Sheets, as, as well as all your other projects. And we all will look forward to seeing them get optioned and come out in the theaters and... You know, we're going to get on that organ donor uh, right. campaign as like well. To, uh, real quick, uh, I would like to say to anybody that reads my books or the books of any other, you know, writer with independent publishing companies or small publishing companies, you know, please go and review the books online, whether you like them or not, because reviews do count. They do matter. Uh, whether you think they do or not, they really do. Even... I mean, please say something more than this book sucks. But, yeah, <laughs> please. You know, but, you know, uh, support like that, it, it does count. It does help. It does matter. And it also lets us know that it doesn't just show other writers that the book may or may not be important, but it lets us know that there are people actually out there reading the damn things. Yes, yes, which hopefully encourages people to continue to write. Right. That's a wonderful point. All right. Well, thank you, lady. I sure appreciate it. Oh, thank you, hon. And we'll, of course, stay in touch and, um, you know, keep me posted on everything that's going on, please. Hey, that sounds great. Thank you so much. All right, hon. Take care. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you. This concludes the second and final part of a conversation with Andy Rausch, a.k.a. Andrew J. Rausch, writer of fiction and nonfiction with over 37 books published and counting. His books and stories can be found on Amazon. And don't forget to check out his blog. Just Google author Andy Rausch. That's A-U-T-H-O-R-A-N-D-Y-R-A-U-S-C-H. Happy reading.